Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Matthew 9, 18 through 26. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if, only, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put aside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went through all that district. This is the word of the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, I thank you uh, for your word that you've given to us. I thank you for giving us your spirit. Spirit, I pray that you would soften our hearts and open our ears, that we would receive your word to us this morning. Lord, I pray over Brian um, that you would speak through him, that uh, through preaching and hearing the word, you would just help us know you more and shine you brighter to the world around us. Amen. Thank you, Janie. Once again, the most eloquent and beautiful scripture reading in the history of any church and anywhere. Hey, real quick, before I uh, begin, I see some visitors in the crowd. I would like to uh, welcome you and say we are so glad that you are here. Rob and I, as your pastors, and Matt, your elder, would love to get to know you. So if you are here and visiting, and you can stand it, you know, if you're an introvert and you want to just make an escape route, we get it. But we'd love to meet you and talk to you just for a bit after service. So please consider doing that. For those of us who have been here, you know we're continuing in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be uh, talking about a couple of characters that I love dearly and resonate with in many ways, and I think you're going to find uh, that you may as well. A little bit of of my story. Some of you know this, some of you don't. Uh, I came into faith through many, a long series of life crises where I was setting out to destroy myself, and God would not allow me to do that. One particular story came to mind as I was writing my sermon. Uh, when I was 20 years old, it's the early 90s, I'm dating myself, uh, I was a drug addict, and a large part of how I funded my drug addiction would be through committing crime. And uh, the last time that I got incarcerated, um, I had already had a pretty, pretty lengthy criminal record, and I was caught committing uh, several crimes, and I was being processed downtown. And at that time in the early 90s, there was something that they passed in the state of California called the Three Strikes Law. And that law essentially said that if you're a habitual and violent or uh, dangerous criminal who was committing uh, felony crimes, you could get an automatic sentence of 25 years minimum to life. And uh, God was working through some pretty extraordinary circumstances. I found myself in short order uh, in the old jail downtown, which Herb is probably pretty familiar with, um, talking to a public defender about the fact that I had two previous violent felony convictions, and the crimes that I was incarcerated for at that moment could be considered my third strike. And I remember the public defender said, as she was going in to talk to the prosecutor to see if she could get me a plea deal, she said, if you're the praying type, I'd be praying. And uh, when she left, I could tell you that I offered, perhaps in many ways, the first genuine and desperate prayer of my life in that moment. Now, I'm here, and I'm here to tell you that I got a plea deal. <laughs> that more, Yeah, talk about winning, right? And I would also love to tell you as a pastor, from that day on, I walked with Jesus, lock and step, every day of my life. But that would be a lie. (laughs) I don't know if that was the point at which I was saved, but I could tell you two things. That prayer was desperate, and that prayer was genuine. 
But what happened over the next 10 years of my life is I spent a decade trying to treat God like he was an add-on or a software update to the complexities of my life. And I wanted to create a life that I could enjoy, and if God wanted to be a part of that, great. And God in his mercy would bring me into different life crises that would absolutely drive me in desperation to him until finally I experienced one after 10 years where I could definitively say there was a moment when I threw my entire heart, soul, and life at Jesus, and he gladly received me. If you noticed in the reading, we're going to talk about the story of two individuals that learned how to do the same thing. And we're going to think about how you and I are probably more like them than we may realize. And then we're going to really focus on what Jesus' response is to them and us. So big idea here is simply this, that God is committed to showing you and I that he's our only hope. But more importantly, he's the only hope that we need in this life. Two ways I want to think about it. First, God is in the business of saving people from trusting in anything from him. And he'll do anything to to convince us of that. If you guys know me, uh, you know my teaching style in the Gospels. I love doing character studies. I'm going to do it again. If you don't like it, bear with me. I'll try and be brief. There's a lot about these two people and their real life experiences that offer you and I wisdom and insight into God and really our own heart and our own faith. Uh, First, Rob has mentioned this before, but I just want to clue you in. Matthew has got an agenda here in this section of his gospel. He's going to, you're going to notice, and you've probably already noticed if you've been studying with us, that he's doing rapid fire miracles. And he's taking all these narratives that are sometimes longer in the other gospel stories, particularly Luke and Mark, and he's abbreviating them and just giving us the core of the story, a core teaching truth that points us towards Jesus. And he does that. Uh, particularly with this synagogue leader. I think in Matthew's account, it simply says that he was a leader. If you are familiar with Mark's uh, gospel in particular, it says that he's a synagogue leader and his name is Jairus. If you don't know what that is, first century synagogues would be organized in a certain way with certain leaders in it. And so a synagogue leader would be something that's not far off from a modern day deacon, although they would hold more power and influence in the community at that time. And so this man that is approaching Jesus in crisis is a man who is probably the third most influential man in the local synagogue. Uh, Second, it's important to note that Mark says his name. He's a well-known man in the community. This is recorded so people would say like, oh yeah, I know that guy. Uh, That guy is a leader in that community where that synagogue exists. Second, he probably had some type of wealth Uh, He definitely had religious and social influence. Now think about the larger backdrop. Jesus is a pretty divisive figure at this point in time in the gospel. And a lot of people are undecided about him. And as Rob pointed out in the conversion of Matthew, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were definitely against Jesus. What this man is doing is pretty public and pretty risky. Uh, This may be theorizing, but I think it's safe to say that as a synagogue leader who is exposed to God and his writings all the time, Jesus probably wasn't this man's first option. And if you think about it, that'd be kind of logical. He would probably go to the synagogue if he had time and pray. Or he would go to the priests and ask them to pray and anoint his daughter if he had the opportunity to do that, right? Uh, Second, this woman who has a bleeding issue. You know, sometimes scholars theorize about what her issue is. It may have been a very uh, well-known condition now where when somebody is on their menstrual cycle, they have hemorrhaging problems and they have continual bleeding. It may have been spiritual in nature. We don't know that. That's not really honestly the important part, but seeing what she went through and how it affected her really is the point that Matthew is trying to illustrate for us here. Uh, First, if you're familiar with Old Testament 
ways of life, particularly the Old Testament Levitical laws. There were all these laws that would dictate if somebody had certain conditions that they were considered ceremonially unclean, which means that they would have to separate themselves from the community of God's people, from their social community, until that condition was dealt with, until they didn't have that problem anymore. Just think about that for a second. This is a woman who had a condition that made her unclean, according to Old Testament standards, and therefore isolated from her world for 12 years straight. You know, I was thinking about uh, kind of the, the world that we found ourselves living in during COVID and how there is a very real concern about people who were susceptible to getting sick or had illnesses isolating themselves. This isn't a political or social commentary. It's an observation. But there's very real data on how devastating that isolation was for people who were suffering during that time. Now imagine what this woman experienced having to do that for 12 years. Second, if you notice, we don't even know her name. There's nowhere in any of the three gospel accounts that we know her name. This was not a prominent person in that community. She was a nobody. Third, the social and spiritual isolation that she experienced. Whether or not this is the intention of how those Levitical standards were taught to her, how she understood them, the net effect on her life was very real. She was cut off from being able to worship. She was cut off from being able to have community. The toll that that must have took on her soul is hard to wrap your mind around. Two extremes. One person who's at the top of the spiritual and social strata in the world in which he lived. Another person that likely had no social status at the bottom of the strata. But they share one thing in common. They both had a very real need that they couldn't meet on their own. And they both experienced a level of desperation that we all go to great lengths to avoid having to deal with in our life. They both were pushed in desperation in their suffering beyond the normal circumstances, the normal resources, the normal parameters of their life to seek help. That's what we're seeing here. Think about it. For Jairus, that would have been massively risky to his reputation to approach a person who's a healer and ask him to help as opposed to going to the synagogue and asking for prayer. For this woman, as I'm kind of already sketching here for you, she would be risking a lot of things. Number one, she'd be risking breaking the Levitical law. If you notice in the details of this picture, there's a huge crowd, and she pushes her way right through to try and get at Jesus. Now, if you're familiar with it, she'd be like risking making every person that she came in contact with with ceremonially unclean. People wouldn't be happy about that. She was risking rejection from the spiritual authorities in her life. Regardless of how devout she was, she lived in a community where what the priest taught was meaningful and important. Even if it was just the cultural value of it, it was important. She'd be risking rejection and ostracizement in a way that's hard to wrap your mind around unless you've experienced something like that. Third, she didn't know Jesus. She was risking being rejected by this healer. She didn't know how Jesus would respond if she had to deal with him. I think about that often in her motives that Matthew notes. Now, if you're like me, you always take the highest view of yourselves. Have you ever noticed, you know, an easy way is like if you're in a fight with your spouse or a friend or your employer or somebody makes you mad, you always kind of come out on top, right? In your mind. And when I think about myself with my faith, you guys, I can be guilty of the same thing. Like I always think that I'm going to God with the best of motives, prioritizing him and with a pure and clean faith that's not divided in any way. 
Now on the clear days when I'm honest, I see that that's not really my track record. <laughs> and maybe you relate to that. Both of these people for different reasons because of the crisis that they were experienced were coming to God as mixed bags. They were showing up with mixed bags. Some of their motives were very good. The most important ones seemed to be very good for both of them. In other ways, I am sure they're no different than you and I, that they were showing up pretty mixed about what they thought and what they felt or what they wanted from Jesus. Here, here's the important part about this story. It's incredibly sweet to notice Jesus' response to both of them, what his disposition is to both of them in the midst of desperation and crisis. Think about the woman. <clears throat> Just, I resonate deeply with this woman on a lot of levels. Think about how she approaches him. If you notice, Matthew makes one small note in that she was thinking to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. Mark goes into a bit more detail about this, but she is convinced, I, I don't need to talk to this man. I don't need to ask him to have a relationship with him. I don't even need to have him pay that much attention to me. If I could just touch this man's garment, I know that I'll be healed. So two, th two things to notice. She had genuine faith in the divine power that Jesus possessed. Can we all agree on that? She believed that he had divine power. What else? This girl had some superstitions. <laughs> Wherever they came from and whatever they looked like, she had some misguided understandings of how Jesus worked and how his divine power operated. But what's Jesus' response to her? He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't turn her away. Here's my favorite part. He doesn't stop and give her a systematic theology lesson. He doesn't say like, look, totally I'm going to heal you, but we got to get you set on the basics here first, okay? Let's get that straightened out and then totally I'm going to heal you. But you got to be clear on the fundamental doctrines. No. Jesus, being God, sees the very center of her heart and soul. And what does he see? Real faith. All jacked up. And he's like, totally. <laughs> what is his response to her? You know, when he uses the word daughter, it's an incredibly endearing and validating expression that he's giving her, you guys. Think about it. 12 years in the dark, 12 years of loneliness and isolation and wondering what God's up to and why he's letting you suffer. Unanswered prayers. Go to the Gospel of Mark and Luke and read the details. They both note that she had spent 12 years spending everything that she had and she only grew worse. Jesus' response is so sweet and so validating. He calls her daughter like he knows her because he does. And what does he say? Dicey doctrine, but faith, that's what healed you. No. He says, your faith has made you well. And she's healed. The word used here means at that moment, at the moment of her encounter with the living God, she was healed. Think about Jairus. This man had to really weigh out the risk of going to a known healer who was a pretty divisive figure in the world in which he was operating. Even if he had only from the time that he saw his daughter at death's doorstep to the time that he found Jesus, I guarantee you he was weighing the costs and thinking about the risks involved in asking this man to intervene in his daughter's life. It's interesting to note, Matt is being very brief here. Matt says that at the point that Jesus and him have this conversation, his daughter is dead. Mark gives us the blow by blow and says that when this man approaches Jesus, he says, my daughter is at death's doorstep. And then in the midst of Jesus interacting with this woman and healing her, his servants come and say, look, there's no reason to bother him anymore. Your daughter has died. A lot of the times when I read Mark's version that gives the blow by blow and I think about the picture of Jaira saying, look, she's at death's doorstep. I need you to help me after counting the cost and then seeing Jesus stop and have this whole interaction with this woman. 
as a finite man, as a parent, it's hard for me to not wonder the roller coaster of emotions he must have went through in that moment. Right? I mean, we got to be fair to this man on what he must have been going through. It's totally understandable to think this man would have experienced fear, doubt, second guessing Jesus, worry, anxiety, even frustration. I mean, honestly, if somebody, if you went, if you were a parent and you took one of your children to the emergency room and the surgeon who could save your child's life stopped to do a consultation with somebody, wouldn't you be like, yo, man, I get it, but my child's dying, right? Think about Jesus' response to this man. (laughs) He simply turns to him and he says, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. The only thing you need to do is believe in me. He doesn't minimize this man's terror. He doesn't minimize his suffering. He doesn't gaslight him for having all these mixed up feelings about what's going on and not understanding. You guys, there's a huge Huge application for every one of us just in this point alone. I, you know, I am, um, I'm really fascinated by this concept over the last couple of years, this concept of an Ebenezer that's in the Old Testament. There was this practice in the Old Testament where they would kind of build these monuments in the, in the book of Samuel. There's a cool story where He's with the people of God and he takes this stone and he places it in front of all the people and he says, this is going to be an Ebenezer. And that word literally means a stone of help. And he goes on to illustrate, look, when you have been wayward, God has been your helper and this stone is going to exist. And we're going to leave it here, not just for now, but for all ages, for all people. When they see this stone, they will remember that our God is a God who helps even when we're wayward. And Jairus is receiving his first Ebenezer in this super intense experience he's having. You see, in answering Jairus' plea, even in the act of healing the woman, he's giving him his first Ebenezer, his first reminder that God is a God of help. And it's all right here. Think about it. Jairus' eyes are, his focus is dead set on Jesus. Even as Jesus' focus is dead set on this woman and healing her. And Jairus hangs on to hope that maybe this man could still do something. There's a huge application here, you guys. You want to know the secret that lies behind Philippians 4, 6 through 7 in avoiding fear and doubt and worry and letting it rule your heart and destroy your life? It's all in what you focus on. Ra was just talking about this a couple weeks ago. To the extent that you and I keep our focus on Jesus, fear and worry will not overwhelm us. To the extent that you and I focus on our fear, our worry, our crises, our doubt, our pain, it will overwhelm us and it'll drag us away from God. Here's the beauty. I mean, in seeing how God works in other people's lives, you are faced with a faith proposition. I've done both. Let me let you off the hook. You can conclude that God is dropping the ball in your life and fall into doubt and fear and cynicism and frustration and anger against God. And I've done plenty of it in my life, you guys. I know where it ends up. Or you can look at how God works in other people's lives and that could be an Ebenezer to you. That could be an anchor of hope because you're being faced with a proposition, an invitation by God. If he is willing to do it in that person's life, this is what Jairus was experiencing. If he's willing to do it in that person's life and he is who he says he is, I'm going to take it on faith that he'll do the same in mine in his own perfect way 
in his own perfect timing. It's a beautiful picture. In the same moment, Jesus is caring for the person who nobody sees. And he's equally and perfectly caring for the person that everybody is convinced has special access to him. Why? Because they had the same need that only God could meet. Let me tell you something. I know this firsthand. Your prayers are never more earnest and your hope in Jesus is never more invested than when everything in this world has failed to help you. And Jesus doesn't hold it against you that your faith is imperfect and in process and he's not the first choice. It's almost unbelievable. But that's what the story illustrates. There's a sweet gift in that desperation because it facilitates this experience with God and it brings us into contact with a beautiful aspect of Jesus' heart for you and I. That he does care for you. And that the timing of his care and his help is always perfect. You guys, I find deep comfort. I find incredible strength in knowing that Jesus proves time and time again that he is wholeheartedly committed to you and I. And we need that. We need that when we are in those moments where everything is unraveling and we're feeling guilty and self-condemning about not going to God first because he doesn't hold that against us. He does just the opposite, just like he did for these two people. He acts on their behalf. What are the requirements? A genuine faith. That's all jacked up. (laughs) I'm going to submit that it's all jacked up because every human being doesn't have perfect faith. (laughs) Guys, that's great. That means we all qualify. (laughs) You don't need a high credit score spiritually with God. (laughs) Uh, That brings me to the second thing that I want us to consider, that through Jesus, God shows us that he has more power than you and I could ever imagine, and he uses it on our behalf. Just to calibrate with you, remember where we're at in this section of the Gospel of Matthew. He is recording and summarizing in rapid fire all of these miracles that Jesus is doing. And his goal as an author, the Holy Spirit's goal here, is to authenticate Jesus' identity and his power, right? And that's actually relevant, if you think about it, to the circumstances and the context of these two healings. Because his choice to be associated and to interact with these two people rearranges a lot for everybody that would be watching him and trying to figure out who he is. His association with both the woman and particularly this girl who seems to be in the backdrop who has actually died are pretty important to authenticating Jesus' identity and the extent of his power. Quick sketch, violation of Levitical law. We've talked about it a little bit, but one of the implications is if you were the person who interacted with somebody who had a condition and most importantly, one of the most serious violations, a dead body, you would be unclean yourself. And so to risk doing that became something to consider, something that people took seriously. We saw a very misaligned and misinformed and twisted view of that in one of our recent sermons, how people would take that to an extreme and have a very narrow view of that, use that to really cut people out of God's community and God's presence. But here, Jesus does something radical uh, in light of the narrow view of the law that, that was taught in their day. Remember, uh, Rob gave us a teaching where he said that these laws had great purpose in God's plan. 
They were given to teach us a spiritual truth. Certainly they had practical value. But their ultimate purpose was to teach us a spiritual truth that anything that God considers unclean and out of bounds is symbolic of the nature and the effect of sin and death. And so as people that belong to God were to be separated from that and to be connected to it or affected by it means that we would experience the consequences of sin. Separation from God and others and ultimately the worst consequence, death. So what is Jesus doing here? He's rearranging this entire narrow view and understanding of what God does and kind of obliterating their narrow view of the law. You see, in the backdrop of this whole story, what these people are experiencing is the fact that Jesus is he's authenticating who he is, his identity and his power through addressing the greatest problem that we all face. It's the consequences of sin, the most devastating one being death. Both of those are present. This woman was cut off in every conceivable way. This man's daughter, this little girl, experienced the ultimate consequence of sin. She was drugged into death. Jesus' actions are radical. (laughs) He doesn't slow down to be hindered or worried about any of that. In touching both, he rearranges people's vista. He rearranges their view of how God operates. Two ways. First, and I love this, he brings the compassion of God to bear in both of those situations. In associating with these people and their brokenness and their suffering so that they may be made whole. That's an easy statement to say, but think about it. It would rearrange their entire existence. This woman could be free to be a part of life again. This man's deepest fear has been alleviated. This girl, who we only have a few details about, who was drugged through death's door, is brought back to life. Second, what is Jesus illustrating both for them and for us and for all of creation? That the curse of sin, the separation that it brings from God and others, can be reversed through him. And that's what he is proving to the world, that he has the power to do that. Here's a way that I want you to think about these people's experiences. These people's encounters with Jesus are like living parables. They teach us something incredibly important about how Jesus chooses to use his power in the lives of people who have faith in him. Through their experience with Jesus, their lives became living testimonies, walking, talking Ebenezers for other people to see and to be reminded their God is a God who helps. The woman who the whole world shut out is welcomed back into life. The man who experienced the depths of powerlessness and sorrow is given great joy. The girl who experienced the sting of death is brought back among the living. And think about it. Their experience is your experience. Jesus' words to them are Jesus' words to you. When he says, daughter, your faith has made you well, he's saying that to you. When he says, don't fear, only believe, those are his words to you. Think about if you are here and you are walking in faith in Jesus, think about the moment that you realized you were saved. You were brought from spiritual death into life, into the presence of Jesus for all eternity. Their story is your story. And in the same way that God displayed his power through their crises, he does the same for you. Through our relationship with Jesus, our lives become living parables. Your life is a living parable, whether you like it or not. (laughs) Subjectively, oftentimes, when we're desperate enough to pray as a last resort, we feel like it's us reaching out to God, right? 
the reality is, is it's always God. It's always God reaching out to you. When you're at the end of your rope and you feel like you can't hold on and your last ditch effort is to take a leap of faith and pray, it's God setting it all up, bringing you to the end of yourself, positioning him self in just the right spot at just the right time to catch you. Why? So that your life is a walking, talking, living parable about the God who saved you and the God that you serve. You know, we talk about being disciples who share our faith in a world that doesn't believe that faith in Jesus is relevant or needed. And there's no better example of what our God does than when we place our whole life before him and surrender ourselves to him and watch how he works supernaturally. We become a living testimony. You want to know what being a good disciple looks like? That's it. It's being a person who's like, man, all I know is I was in a jail cell, I prayed, and then 10 years later, despite my best efforts to avoid God, and boy, I tried, he got a grip on me. To being a person who, like, the first thing I realized after being in church my whole life was that I was as sinful as they say they are. Next thing I realized, there was Jesus telling me that he had grace and forgiveness and I could walk with him. That's what I know. That's your story. It's a privilege that we have, even in the midst of being desperate, it's a privilege that we have to give it to God and to share that with other people. Let's thank God for that, you guys. Join me in prayer, won't you? Our Father in heaven, we thank you. (laughs) We thank you that you are so different than us. You're not like us, God. You are steady and true and righteous and holy and powerful. And you see us in all our struggles, Lord, the limitations of our faith, our misunderstandings about who you are, how you're operating in our life, our willingness to choose something over you so often. You don't hold any of that against us. To be reminded that just the opposite is true, that in response to that, that you draw near to us and you use your power and your might and your glory To glorify yourself through loving us and helping us is astounding. Father, I pray that every one of us would be comforted in that. And every one of us would be challenged in that. And that we would feel that healthy conviction that your love and grace brings to make you the greatest priority of our lives. And to lay it all before you and that other people would see that. Lord, we pray that you would make that so for Christ's sake and his glory. It's in his name that we pray these things. Amen. If I could ask you to stand and join me as we approach the Lord's table.